Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this session. After the coup d'etat, what comes next? This is a conversation that we'll have with His Excellency Ali Lamin Zain, Prime Minister of Niger. I'm joined today by my colleague Cameron Hudson, and this conversation will be taking place in two languages. Welcome again, and Cameron, to you. Thank you, Vemba. Uh, bonjour, bon après-midi et bonsoir. Hello, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome the Prime Minister of Niger, Mr. Zain. He was named uh, Prime Minister in August of this year, about one year after the military junta removed from power President Bazoum. Before his nomination, the minister was a resident representative at the African Bank in Chad and other countries of the region. Before he was director of cabinet of Mamadou Banja, he was minister of finance and the economy from 2003 to 2007. Mr. Prime Minister, we are very happy to welcome you here to have a talk with us. We are grateful for your willing to speak to the public in Washington and to the world on the situation in Niger now, five months after the coup d'etat, and the way which you think you will be able to face the important challenges of your country and all over the region. I'd like to start with a question on the importance of the coup d'etat for the public in Washington. The shocking aspect of the coup d'etat in Niger last July, from Washington's point of view, was that Niger was a stable democratic partner in a very unstable region but that Niger understood the value and benefits of a partnership with Washington, security assistance, development aid, institution building. Yet, the coup d'etat feels like a rejection of this relationship and these values. How should we interpret what happened in Niger? Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Very well, thank you. I'd like to thank you in the name of the government of my country, in the name of Mr. Chami, head of state, for this opportunity that you have given us and to also give our point of view and our versions of the facts. But before this, I would like to correct a little bit what you said regarding my career. In fact, I was Minister of the Economy and Finance from 2003 to 2010, not 2007, sorry, sorry. So you'll understand later why I'm making this precision. It's important before speaking about the facts, this non-constitutional change to remind everyone that the Sahel region is a region which has been heavily affected in 2011 following the uh, Alibi, the Libyan uh, war and the attack by the NATO and the assassination of Gaddafi by NATO. The consequences did not uh, wait to spread out to Niger, Mali, Chad and other countries in the region a little Mauritania, which was not a, as much affected as those countries. The results, obviously, and we can also say the results of the fight against terrorism, which began at that period, were completely mixed, and the countries were faced with them, their own selves. The insecurity in Libya had a devastating effect on the country. I'd like to underscore that Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso are three countries which are part 
of an organization called ALG since 1970s. Recently, they decided to create and to reinforce this organization and by Im implementing the dimension of the struggle against uh, insecurity in favor of development and defense. And we must keep this in mind because to go back to the case of Niger, the coup d'etat which happened on July 26 was a coup d'etat which came to save the Nigerian people. Because if you take the years from 2011 to 2003, we saw the development of the insecurity, even though there was a massive presence and massive cooperation, military cooperation, this coup came to save the populations because aside from the insecurity, there was very bad governance. I can understand from an American point of view, you don't see it from a good point of view, but for the Nigerians, we must say, it's a complete deliv deliverance from those problems because we decided to take a path which will lead us to a better future, much better future, to go back to our true values, the values of good governance, the good, the values of a way which will, f for the first time, bring us to free and transparent elections. Why? Because what happened? Remember that in 2020, when there were the elections, everyone knows what happened. They didn't occur in a good uh, way, not well. Yet, the Nigerians stayed calm and closed their eyes to give a chance to the person that was so-called elected, supposedly elected. We let him a chance to manage, but it didn't go as planned, as we hoped, rather. If you, it shocks you, in Nigeria, we have a feeling of deliverance. We'll go back into the details later. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your uh, explanations. But in the world, we knew Niger as a democracy. Going into the process of democracy, the coup d'etat seems to have derailed this. And the ECOWAS and other institutions are asking you to bring the country back on the path of democracy. What are you doing that your, what is your government doing in that direction? Thank you. You say in the world, but maybe yes, but in Niger, everyone knew that it wasn't a real democracy for 10 years. We didn't have the right to do any, uh, to freedom of speech, uh, to contest. Uh, and to protest. And what symbolizes democracy is the creation of structures which are with uh, maintained by a person, political personnel. But there were great tears and destructions that were provoked, very bad governance. And I think if you look at, uh, if you look objectively at the situation, you will see yourselves that there was a period during which we couldn't really speak of democracy. It's not because I was part of the regime from 2000 to 2010 that I say otherwise, but it was a period of relative stability when I was there. All political parties had their say. Journalists were free to express what they wanted. The management of public funds was well done very well done, and those that wanted to expre ex uh, express themselves were free to do so. But what happened after this? You are a witness that there were no people able to express themselves. Is that what you call democracy? Me, I think that's not the case. Once you cannot express one's opinions, when you uh, 
pillage public funds and mismanage public funds and when citizens do not do not have rights you cannot speak of a democracy if the military is if the military the nigerian militaries which are now the head of state uh, took on their responsibilities it's not military people that are simply of living rooms they are people who have value that are known in the region and further and they thought that it was time to bring the country back to the path of democracy they were the same that in 99 with the help of the united states that uh, bad elections would take place we are convinced that the way things are going now we will go back to this path so that niger really goes back to the image of a country where people can easily and freely express themselves where public funds are well managed where accountability is uh, done to the population that's what i can say on this level so for me maybe that's your opinion is different but in niger we think that the dem dem democracy was not respected before the coup d'etat and i think that now we will go back to the principle of democracy mr prime minister you are going to go back to this principle of democracy when when can we expect to find this transition of towards democracy to uh, put uh, the country back on the path as you say in quotes you spoke to uh, about ECOWAS. It's an organization whose objective is to work on regional integration, the sharing of solidarity, a better appreciation of values, com common values of the different states and the different peoples and uh, faced with the events of july 26th they abandoned the values of their charter that institution itself does not respect the rules under which it was created and took sanctions which i can qualify as punitive against the people which is standing near in favor of its authorities that is hoping for better cooperation with the international community and greater liberty based on equilibrium, mutual respect and solidarity in respect to our independence and the choices that we took to uh, liberate ourselves from what came before. With this institution, we, even though they punished us on the basis of a, a completely subjective basis, we none, nonetheless in the next few days the first week of january we will fix a date as we already said which will not go over three years everyone knows that in niger there were three non-constitutional changes we never went beyond the three years at the time at the proper time you will have details on this uh, transition dates and or uh, understanding th with that institution of the ECOWAS uh, in due time we'll have more information on this thank you your excellency in the next few days the French fo military forces will be completely out of Niger at the same time last week uh, Niger uh, held high-level talks with the uh, United States and Russia. The United States uh, wants to maintain its military presence in Niger, and the Russian minister proposed uh, security assistance. Can you speak to us of your objectives and the way that you will balance out the interests of these great superpowers in Niger? Can these superpowers coexist in Niger, according to yourself. That's what I was trying to tell you. The or choice to affirm or sovereignty it rests on an essential point. That is the free administration of our destiny or, or free choices to engage in different partners, all partners. We are ready to respect that all that are prepared to respect our country. 
and accepting the fact that we have interests to defend at the same time. Remember in 2007, Niger had decided to uh, change the price of uranium. The next day, we know what happened. The, our main partner armed part of our population. A few people, in fact, took arms. Uh, but thanks to the wisdom of Nigeria, we were able to find a solution. We sat down together. We explained what to this partner why it was important that our interests be safeguarded and uh, bringing them to respect these interests. Regarding our perspectives on the institutional and political plane, we decided to engage with all who are in favor of peace, any country, any people. We are in the Sahel. We are an ancient civilization which is open to the whole world. If you speak of the great powers that are coming to see us, we can only accept if they wish to come work with us, but with a clear and transparent method. In With the United States and their mission, we clearly expressed ourselves along these lines. We told them that Americans must de decide if they want to stay with us, tell us exactly what they must want to do here. Americans have a military, a military presence here. We told the American representatives that we would like to see American investors rather than American military. I rem remind you, at, before 2011, there was not a single foreign military officer in Niger, not a single terrorist in Niger. We couldn't help it if our average citizens created a link between the military presence and the forthcoming of terrorism. The Americans are our allies and our friends, but we want a transparent and clear attitude. I will repeat what I said to the Undersecretary. I said that in July 2023, we saw clouds coming on the horizon. The American army and the Nigerian army were side by side. The le next day, the Americans left, left their role next to us. When we really needed that strategic partner, they disengaged. And the Minister of Defense is now working on the best way to collaborate with this historic partner, which we consider as a friend, the U.S as an ally. It's up to the United States to decide if they want to stay with us. They are welcome if they do. For the rest, it's the same. Our cooperation with Russia is uh, long dates from many years now. We worked on them on the, uh, the aeronautics sector. And they helped us in our defense work in this the aeronautic sector. They have their place, just like the Americans have their place and other partners that knock at our door. And we will make sure that the interests of all who come be preserved under the condition that they respect our interests. That's what I can answer in regards to this question. Merci. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, the world is worried about the condition, the health of President Bazoum, former President Bazoum. Where is he and what are the conditions and how is he doing and what are the conditions for his liberation? I would like to hear you say rather that you, the world were was concerned about the 26 million Nigerians that are facing unfair sanctions by the ECOWAS. We don't have enough energy, we don't have electricity, we don't have sufficient medication, simply because that organization decided to punish us. 
That's 26 million Nigerians that are being punished. The former president, I can assure you, he still lives in the presidential palace. The residence of the president's president of the republic. To General Shani, to show his goodwill, or order that nothing be lacking to Mr. Bazoum, who is our compatriot, who manages the state at a point, who is in excellent conditions. I can certify you. I accompanied the ECOWAS mission, and they themselves, he himself knew, said that to them that he knew no difficulties whether health-wise or otherwise. otherwise. President Shani, he is uh, uh, elsewhere. We would like rather to hear the world and you yourself worry about the 26 Niger million Nigerians that are suffering because the ECOWAS took into as hostage the taxes of Niger there's a decision that comes from God knows where. In fact, we know it. It's France that asked for this, we must say. If you would like to hear us, we should feel that you are worried about the fate of all the Nigerians. There were five coup d'etats in Niger, six in total that are non-constitutional. The first president, Jury, he spent... 13 years in a military camp. We never heard the international community worry about him. President Husman, he spent weeks and weeks in a military camp. ECOWAS or the international community or anyone else ever worried about his fate. President Bade was not unlucky. He was killed. President Tanja, nobody reacted. The president uh, was in his, with his own son, 15 months in a prison. He, in fact, uh, contracted diseases. He died three years ago, his son a year ago. No one worried about this. No one expressed a word. Please be have some justice in regards to us. And Niger is a country that is a peaceful country. Niger has certain values. Human values are sacred in Niger. You can be sure of that. President Bazoum, I think, for his own security. In fact, we don't trust these countries that are asking for his freedom. We are afraid. Follow my... my Eyes. Speaking of your look, speaking of the justice for Niger, Niger and its people, President Bazou is being held as a prisoner. What are the adjectives do you attach to his detention? And number two, since you spoke to ECOWAS sanctions, what are you planning to do so that those sanctions can be lifted and so that the people of Niger can be freed, spared. Niger's population cannot access to medicine, food. They are prisoners of these sanctions. What uh, adjectives can I use regarding this? I think we should keep our heads clear. Regarding ECOWAS, we started to talk with them. They in demanded three conditions at the beginning. The first was, despite the rapid application and unique nature of these sanctions, was to simply engage in dialogue. There were many missions between Niger, Nigeria and ourselves. The second uh, issue was about the health of the former president. They were able to see where and in what conditions he is living. The third condition was about the length of the transition. This was also indicated. We were expecting that these sanctions were to be lifted, yet they were maintained. So I invite you to 
ask this question to ECOWAS. When do they in intend to lift these sanctions? We, in the last summit, expressed our availability. The head of state of the Congo and we received a mission from their foreign office. We expressed our desire to lift the sanctions and end this crisis. It's up to them to decide if they want to continue to punish the Niger people. Uh, and how do you consider the former president? Is he a political prisoner or other? Wise. I will ask you, since this seems to uh, preoccupy you very much, you, it's up to you to apply whatever adjectives you want. All I can say that he, he is in good health, as the head of state himself said, he will be freed. Niger, as I said, is a peaceful people, open to everything to find the best, uh, most consensual solutions. So I hope very much that we will keep this in mind. You know, it doesn't help the former president every time that uh, people scream about him. I gave you all the list of the former presidents that were in the same situation, but were never uh, helped so much or never inquired so much in the past. So you must admit this on your side. Thank you. On this issue, last week, the uh, tribunal of the of ECOWAS ordered the f freedom for uh, for President Bazoum, his liberation. What is your opinion on this judgment? And what are the relationships that you plan to have with ECOWAS in the future? This uh, meeting is seems to be all about president, the former president. I thought it would be more about the future, that it would be about how to get our country back on the road towards a modern democratic state, well managed. And since we are, and since we are uh, speaking about this institution, I can say, why don't you go around Africa, West Africa, and ask them about uh, this ECOWAS tribunal, which does whatever it wants. If you ask them their uh, point of view, they answer any which way. Myself, I have no comment on this. Can you speak about the effects of the regional sanctions on Niger so that we can better understand the effects of these sanctions and the way in which you hope to improve the economic situation of your country? Now, since uh, July 26th, all of the resources of our country were taken hostage by those community institutions. So how did we deal with this void? Thanks to the resilience of our people and everybody accepted to contribute to the common effort and also thanks to the great uh, management of the public funds that was uh, reimposed and uh, everything that we did to go towards the right path and because now we think in our opinion that Niger has decided to refuse finally the dictates of those who always wanted to get subsidies but in exchange they were trying to force us to do something that they want us to do, but Niger decided to open itself to all those who want to invest. We are a very rich country. We are taking all the measures so that all the investors who want to come can come with all the guarantees that are, will be due to him. For us, it's a 
parenthesis which will continue which now hurts but inshallah this parenthesis will be closed in the next few weeks the resources which we are collecting locally are well managed and are managed efficiently and we're able to meet our obligations and all the Nigerians today from the small villages to the capital everyone is participating in this war effort effort the resilience efforts this determination which we have is not a question of means but it's a question of will of conviction and in the next few days you will see thanks be to God, how we will be able to get out of this situation. As I said, many partners are proposing to us certain choices, important choices to make, on and on issues of development. We have no doubt that the road that we have taken will finally free us definitively from our former state. Mr. The Prime Minister, Your Excellency, Unfortunately, the time is limited. We would like to thank you. We would like to thank you for your, for your participation. We hope to continue this conversation soon. Obviously, you have many things to share. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. Thanks again. Thanks again so much for having come, for having shared with us. Thank you to our colleague, to my colleague Cameron and everyone who joined us for this discussion with the Prime Minister. Ali Lamin Zain of Niger. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you as well. I would like to express a wish. Please help us get investors come to come to Niger. They will be welcome. Let's have Niger renew with democratic principles. Help us do that through real elections that are not falsified not through relations based on personal interests, but relations based on a people that are, is proud, that is in favor of peace, that is open, and that decided to trace its own destiny. And I'm happy to continue the dialogue when you w want. Thank you. We will pursue this conversation. Thank you.